so there's this really interesting um i don't know it's not a discussion it's a it's a disagreement one a petty disagreement i suppose um it's not it's not petty in its overall in its overall implication but it's petty in terms of um the way the way these discussions go on like like, like petty factional disputes between so-called Han lineage and so-called Yao's lineage I don't believe in any lineage schools no you know my background um you know I started learning in Yao's each one but it's, to me it's all nonsense you know it's not real these are just illusionary structures that we create to, to put our ego in to make us feel like we belong to something um that deviates us from real training and real real knowledge in, in, in my view um, and, and and the reality is it doesn't matter that much actually like you know there's differences in the the, the so-called hands and the so-called yao's way of doing things actually structural movement is an enormously broad concept and the, there can be lots of ways of doing things um, that are very different but that are all correct um, what depends next is how you contextualize that in terms of um, so some, something simple like you know do, do you move your pivot your foot when you throw a jab or do you keep your lower half straight both can be perfectly within the, the structural paradigm of each one it doesn't doesn't make any difference and once you accept that then you can start being kind of a bit more scientific and saying well why why would you do it this way and why would you do it that way and what are the benefits and what are the drawbacks and so on and, the particular thing I'm talking about is push, push hands, twee shall push hands. Um, and, and there is like a really big, bigger issue about like the role and point of push hands. Um, but but the, the bickery, the bickering dispute, it's pathetic really when you think about it, it is whether the, whether Yao Zongzun invented like each one push hands and brought that into, brought that into um, each one. And, and the answer is no. Um, like, like, like a lot of people, I always, I always thought yes, because um, I don't know if I was told this, but I certainly read it. I certainly read people saying like, you know, um, Yao Yao Zongzun introduced this when he was teaching for Wang Shangjai, and then one the story so, supposedly goes, Wang Shangjai turns up one day and you know, Yao Zongzun's running the class and everyone's doing push hands and Wang Shenzhai's, what's this? You know, and, and Yao Zongzun explains, you know, it's a development that he's made. Turns out that can't be true. And, and, and for a very simple reason, that we've got video of like several of Wang Shenzhai's direct students and, and older students doing push hands. Um, so we've got, you know, for example, Wang Bingkui doing push, push hands. Um, we've got, um, Oh, so, so it's most important, well, there's loads anyway, there's loads uh, um, that we've got video of. I'm not going to name check them all because I'll, I'll certainly forget someone. Um, but most importantly, we've got Han Xin Yuan doing push hands, double and single push hands. Um, so the idea is that push hands don't exist in, in hands each one because it hadn't been added by Yao at that point. And, and it ties into another kind of triviality, um, what I think is a triviality. Of, of orthodoxy, the triviality of orthodoxy. Who even wants to be orthodox? Like orthodoxy is like dead, isn't it? It's like the stifling, ossified, bounded foot of orthodoxy. Bound foot grows the least. You know who said that, right? Wang Shenzhai. So we've got Han, Han Xing Yuan doing push hands, and, but it's become such a, like, like, like the, the lesson is right how how people get deviated on the path and Wang Shenzhai warned us not to get into this stuff and, he, and it goes on this big kind of Buddhist thing about um, understanding why you're doing training and that you need to want each one for no reason that's a stage that you come to um, in fact at, at certain points and I've been through this multiple times myself where you don't even know why you're training anymore why am I even training you know what is even the point anymore but somehow you just still keep pushing on just because that's what you do. It's just an integrated part of your life. And what, what he's getting at is like this, this, this really profound, deep co concept. Where like a lot of Wang Shenzhai stuff, you can read it. And it's on one level and then you think about it and there's like, or something happens to you and there's like this, this whole other level of depth. And you think, did he actually mean that? You know, like, did, did he consciously, was he saying that? 
when he said this? And he said, yeah, of course he was, because everything's about, everything he says is geared towards achieving higher levels. So w what he's saying is like, you, you become deviated, depending on what your core reason is for training, you become deviated along that, that line. So if, like, if you want to show off, you become deviated along that line. If you really feel like, you know, if you've got an inferiority complex, you become deviated along that line. If you, um, if if you are kind of sadistic, you know, and you really like hurting people, you deviate along that line. Um, and if you feel kind of inferior or you know alone, I suppose alienated, you become deviated along that line. And that's, that's I think the most common thing. Like you become deviated along this thing where you know you really want to belong to something. So you, you kind of get obsessed with like belonging to lineage and orthodoxy and um, and, and one of the, the children of that, one of the horrible children that descends from that, that mistake is like thinking, well, we're the orthodoxy. No, we're the orthodoxy. Oh, this is nonsense. There's just you training. Um, and, and the idea is that, well, well, it's, it's a very well-known idea in philosophy, um, the idea that if something's older, it appears to be superior. Uh, Jacques Derrida talks about this idea, for example. If it's older, it appears to be superior to the younger. You know, Those who trained earlier, this this is the idea, those who trained earlier with Wang Shanjai get a more Xin Yi Chuan influenced Yi Chuan, that's superior. And also it has this thing of being linked more to traditional Wushu and therefore another orthodoxy of the past. So it's all about orthodoxy and um, the bounded foot. Uh, and then you've got um, this idea that then, well, you know, the kind of, not that this is, not that each one is just divided between this and in reality, it's not divided at all. Uh, Yao's each one is later and that's much more boxing influenced and this is inferior. It's not got the same link to China. It's not as old. It's not as orthodox, you know, and so uh, it, it's become semiotically represented through this idea of push hands, that push hands is something that Yao Zongzong adds, but it just can't be true. But people really want to believe in it and buy into it so much that they'll, they'll go to unbelievable lengths to, um, just to double think. And so, so some things like, well, so um, I think um, one of the hands brothers anyway, you know, but with a big section in on push hands and someone saying, uh, I read someone say, oh yeah, but, um, you know, obviously everyone else was talking about pushing, so he felt he had to. It's like, no, don't start putting words in people, it's just nonsense. We know that they did push hands with, with Wang Chang Jai, we know that, because um, they all do it. Uh, someone else, like, like, there's a video up of um, Han Xing Wang doing, doing push hands, single and double push hands, exactly the same as everyone else. <laughs> and someone, someone had commented saying, this isn't push hands, you're just seeing what you want to see. This is something totally different to push hands. And it's like, no, that's you. That's you, you gaslighting so and so. Like, you're so brainwashed into the, the need to belong to an orthodoxy with its mythology that you would actually twist reality in your mind that what you're actually visually seeing as an empirical fact, you would, you're, you're capable of twisting that into something illusory, which is unbelievable that people can do that detracts in many ways from like, like like the reality is okay maybe like um push hands has gradually been dropped from the people who descended from the the hand brothers um what it's been replaced by in many cases is just utter nonsense so um talk about woo woo and magic powers and so-called what was it hanshi hanshi each one i just people jumping about and throwing themselves about when someone just took. and and this this really silly thing that people do where you just you know you put your hands on someone and move them and they move back and like someone cares try try doing that when someone's assaulting you you know like it just it doesn't mean anything it's nonsense I'm not saying all hands each one by the way like i've seen some some good stuff as well um but this kind of offshoot this kind of modern offshoot it's just nonsense it's just nonsense. I don't, I don't care what anyone thinks, it's nonsense. So push hands really will be a significant improvement on that, <laughs> to bring that back in. And it speaks to this question about, you know, is it, 
Well, it doesn't speak to us, it obscures. That's the problem. It obscures this much broader question of are, are push hands useful? Do they have any, any use? And there's, there's a lot of nonsense talked about this, and then particularly Yao Zichuan people, um, they've kind of gone the other way. So a lot of the Yao Zichuan push hands that I see, I just think it's so detached from the reality of actual combat. It's, it relies so much on people holding their arms out really stiff and leaning forwards with all their weight <laughs> um, and just holding their arms out like that. And then they got all, you know, like what that might happen. You know, one in a million times you might find yourself in a fight where that happens and then you could use, but 90%, 95% of the training is that, you know, like, like you can go, even from China, you can go, like, like there's almost no, there's almost no sparring footage, but there's, there's hours and 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 hours of push hands training that doesn't look anything like a real fight. So um, in some ways it's, it's, it's gone the wrong way. That's gone the other way. You know, you've gone woo woo this way and you, you've gone crystallized into um, formalization, over formalization on this side. Like if you wanted to adapt that, I mean, like I, I do loads of stuff adapting push hands. So I'm not against push hands by any means, but I just do it in a different, um, I don't teach that leaning in way of doing it. Um, that's not what I'm interested in. It's not really even what Yao Zong Zun talks about. Um, look at the way Yao Zong Zun does push hands. That's, that's like my most significant influence in terms of that kind of basic basic push hands. He doesn't do it like that with that, those really big leanings, um, putting all his weight forward and stuff like that. Uh, you get caught up in a, in a vicious circle doing that where like the more people lean in and tense, the easier it is to make all those techniques work. So you start making each other look really great. If you start relaxing again, then it's very, very difficult to make, make that stuff work. But, but what I would suggest is pe people don't, I mean, cause I, cause I hit really fast when I'm sparring, but if you go, if you go back and look very carefully and slow it down and look how much guard breaking and guard engagement I do, how much getting involved with the opponent's guard and using push hands techniques in sparring, um, Half the time it's so fast you probably don't even notice it. You've got to look and see how many times I'm doing that and using push hands techniques. So yeah, it's really, really useful training, but um, push hands isn't the primary way probably of training most of that stuff. A lot of it I've just trained specifically, um, very much like he's taught in proper hands each one where you just engage, like from a kind of sparring situation you engage with the opponent you know, just go in and take the guard down and stuff like that. But I do think, you know, push hands definitely has its has its place. And one one of the useful and you can see when I do push hand sparring, which is another variation that we do, um what what that does is puts you in a very vulnerable position where you've got no guard. You know, so you, you're doing push hands but you've got your gloves on and you your gum shield in and all that. You've got no guard and that attack's coming at any moment. Like and there's nothing you can do. You just, you've got to purely re rely on reactions. Um, that's really, really useful. So, don't don't we get into a big discussion about push hands? But uh, that that whole debate about how push hands could be really useful. You know, things like you know adapting it into wrestling and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, people will lean in on you when in wrestling, but they've usually got hold of you to anchor. You know, they'll anchor with your your head and stuff like that. And, um, some of, some of the stuff I see, some of the stuff I see from Yao's each one push hands. There's there's certain individuals who I think are just criminal assaulters, just, you know, smashing beginners into the floor and stuff like that. I think that's absolutely disgusting and needs really calling out. Other stuff I just think, what, any, anyone can make that stuff work against someone who's massively inferior to you. It's making it work, first of all, make it work in a live scenario, then we'll talk, you know, when someone's actually trying to punch you in the face. And, and I don't think there is, I don't think there is any example of anyone anywhere doing that on film except me so um, let me know if you know otherwise because I just I, I've been looking for it I can't find it you know it's, it's usually just someone who's really good um, training with someone who doesn't even dare throw a punch at them it's just come on who's buying that anymore you know next on Daoism Radio we discuss the appalling state of Taoism in China um, I just there are places there are places where, where 
each man, what I call the, the fantasy each man league. There are places where they meet and discuss stuff and um, these are not good places to go. Um, as, as, as people who have like, like beginners who have honest questions find, find out pretty quickly, unfortunately. Um, but the, you do see some interesting, um, in a way enlightening stuff, because it's kind of enlightening to see the, the, the wrong way of doing things, you know. It, in some ways, nothing makes the right way of doing things clearer than seeing the wrong way of doing things. Well, at least you know, don't go down that path. But but one of these individuals in the um, what I call the fantasy each one league, you know, um, and it's not you know it's not just defamation. You know, it's an empirical fact. You can just go online and see this individual perpetrating. Well, well I, either the laws of physics aren't real or he's for for real. So you know, you have to make a choice over these things. Um, but but talking about as part of this, talking about um, each one as some kind of you know integrated with some kind of high level spiritual Taoist. I mean, I'm laughing at that. I mean, um, I would say like the way is not far from the people. Like like yeah, e each one is profoundly intersected with Taoism, but Taoism like on on a really straightforward level about understanding the way that you know social reality is constructed um, which, which is really important for for example for understanding movement and the way that movement is socially constructed and uh, the way you're taught to move in certain ways the way that um, in, in many ways people are controlled and limited by controlling and limiting their understanding of how to use their own bodies and that's one of the things that makes Wushu fantastic that it, that it extends people beyond those limitations but anyway this this individual is telling this story about how they went to china they traveled across china um which, which is a wonderful thing isn't it for um for for people outside of china to do or or or, or to travel from one side of the world to the other side of the world in search of yourself <laughs> where could you be um, and, and what this speaks to in many ways is like, again, I mean, you think of it kind of like down to earth Taoism and Mike Sunshine does talk about this, as I mentioned before, like this kind of understanding yourself and, and why you train. There's this really interesting thing that, that um, well, there's an idea, there's, there's an idea that I was taught by someone else that alter my cushions. Yes, I need two cushions. <laughs> I'm that age. Um, but I can still feel that there's there's something underneath a P maybe. Um, this, this this idea that I was told that which I think is really good that like actually people don't want to don't want to understand themselves. They don't want to know the truth of themselves. Like if they did, they'd be horrified. You know, like um, and this kind of explains why people will go as far away from themselves as possible in order to to find themselves. I, mean, I know it's not it's not completely true. Sometimes you can see something about yourself in a completely different context, you know, which you can find in another country. I know that I understand that. But when, when it's about spirituality, I, I just think it's quite interesting that um, you know, like 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 Wang Sheng Jai talks about, you know, like intuitive progression. So it's all about understanding yourself and things that happen to you and the way that you move and thinking that the answer is as far away from you as possible. Like, like, I think if possible, people would get in a spaceship and travel, travel through space, um, because it's the last thing they want to do is ever like take a look at themselves and take a look at the reality of themselves. And I think if some of these people, some of these charlatans, actually had a moment of epiphany and saw what they are and what they're doing in terms of swindling other people out of their money to to learn nonsense, like. The, the shock, you know, and this explains, of course, you know, like why they take on all these ridiculous titles and airs and airs and great, literally airs like appointed disciples. You can buy into the, you can buy into the BS and um, calling themselves by titles, feudal titles almost, and uh, creating these little groups around themselves. Sometimes wearing these Taoist, you know, robes with big yin yangs on and stuff like that, and these Taoist robes, and creating an illusory self as as far away from who they truly are as they can possibly get. You know, even 
Well, like like for for non Asian people, right? This this um, this this idea of Orientalism that you 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 right start pretending to be Asian in various different ways, and and it's all about you know if you want to talk about Taoism and spirituality, it's all about really not wanting to have a close look at yourself. But but like Wang Shengjai says, you can't do that. Like you've got to look at yourself, and that's that's the hardest barrier to get through. So you've got to look at things like why why. Why do I want like Wushu knowledge? Why do I want that? You know, and being really honest about that and looking at you yourself and uh, you know I've talked about it before. Um anyway, this this guy tells his story as he goes goes travelling across China, which is quite a romantic sounding thing, isn't it? And uh, the truth of that could be very different, of course, couldn't it? You go on like a package. One of these martial arts package tours where they take you to Wudang and Shaolin, and then when you come back to the West, that's I travelled across. I'm being too, I'm being too cynical, and I don't, I don't know the truth of it. It's not a fly, love. It's like a a lawnmower or something in the distance. No need to be on guard against the the fly, or if it is, make sure you bite it. Um, he says, like he's, you know, he's in search of the Tao. Where could it be? Um, so just think is real. I mean, that's fascinating in itself, isn't it? Like, well, it's not far from the people. We've been told that. In fact, you know, it could be very, very close to the people. Like, it, in fact, it could be in you and indeed in everything. And um, he come. He, he finds this um, this Taoist monk, and this he's telling this story. He's kind of outraged, telling this story about how his expectations were. We're disappointed. He finds this Taoist monk in China who says, for $200, I'll tell you what the Tao is. Which I think is brilliant. And, uh, and you know, and he's outraged and he's saying, like, you know, this is the state of things in Ch this This charlatan who swindles other people for, for their money to teach them nonsense um, is outraged by this. Like, it doesn't fulfil his spiritual expectations of what true Taoism would be and I thought well that doesn't that just totally sum up an entitled Westerner in another country that um, they they think that knowledge of the Tao should come for free <laughs> that there shouldn't be a price to pay for it I would have just paid two hundred dollars go yeah okay tell me um, I just I can't think of anything more like it's a change of perspective, isn't it? Like, like from a certain perspective, you think you can just go to another country and somehow you're entitled to find this spiritual thing, you know, that, that um, actually really is just a proxy for the fact that um, there's something lacking in you uh, or, or you feel like there is. And I mean, I don't believe that there is something lacking in people. I believe like, you know, when, when Wang Shengjia is talking about being honest about why you train, um, I think like, you know, if you're looking at things like, like for me, I had to be very honest about it and, and, and you know, came to the conclusion that like, you know, I really want to just let people to be impressed by me. So it kind of deviated my training in ways that I was working on things that were less useful and more fancy and I've, I've gone full circle with that because now I can really enjoy doing some fancy stuff and I can still do some cool forms stuff and I really enjoy doing that and really weirdly after like a long time out out from doing Taolu I'm just focusing on each one when I came back to Taolu I was miles better from from doing each one I just understood my body more and I could enjoy it more and I didn't have the same it wasn't about impressing people anymore um, so I don't think these things are lax and, and even these people who you know, you've got to say it's not brain surgery, is it, to say that these people have got deep inferiority complexes and that's why they, they posture themselves as fantasy each one heroes and inheritors of some magical um, amazing thing. Um, the PhD level of martial arts that I'll talk about in a moment. And they set themselves up with all these titles and they go on the internet and they're incredibly obnoxious to other people pontificating about meaningless bullshit. It's not a brain surgery to know that there's some kind of inferiority there funding that you know like pushing that forwards and that on some level on some level you go in search of trying to understand that and that's not necessarily a negative thing it can be a really valuable gift i think because it, it it pushes you to it pushes you to search and that's not that's not negative in itself but the the process of searching itself surely has got to like kind of educate you and 
break down some of them barriers, not reinforce them. And for me, just, just like a shift of perspective sees that as like a wonderful moment. Like the Tao is fully encapsulated in that moment of the monk offering to tell you what the Tao is for $200. It's almost a koan, you know, like a Buddhist koan in itself. And, and the inability to see that to me is, is like, like it's a wonderful kind of insight into someone's mind that they couldn't see it like that, that they just see it solely in, in terms of themselves and what they wanted and, you know, they wanted. Um, usually it's people thinking they can buy stuff, isn't it? But, but be actually feeling entitled to go there and find, you know, some monk's just going to tell you this stuff, something wise, you know, and you can consume that. It's like the sociology of tourism, you know, like you can go and consume this other culture, you have some kind of right to it. And after all, you've gone to the effort of traveling across China to find it. Just thought it was such a wonderful thing. And um, it, was a, it was a delight in my day to see that. Um, but there's various things going on in, going on in this discussion, including, you know, just, just the usual of like, it's either being obnoxious to to beginners or people who are just asking questions or people just showing their stuff um, and saying, you know, what do you think of like the, 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 the um, any kind of honest training of any level is better than dishonest training. I don't, you know, like I'd rather see someone who's honest and rubbish than someone who's amazing and on steroids or whatever, you know, or, um, but, but these people aren't even that, are they? Like they're just, it's just nonsense theory. And I've talked about that before. I'm not going to rehearse it. But as part of this discussion, and I talked about it in the last episode, like this idea of, of each one being PhD level, I think that's something that's really interesting and worth unfolding a little bit. Um, and it links into a few things. So again, it links into this ridiculous ego thing um, because it's usually intended to refer to the, the problem that we kind of know of, that maybe Wang Shenzhai wasn't a particularly great teacher. Or, or he was a teacher for a certain kind of student, like you. So, so not all, but but most of his martial arts students were were um, were fairly serious martial artists at that time. And also, that's that's something quite interesting, isn't it? Like, because it, it's not entirely clear what that means by modern standards. Like, so the idea is that all his students were already great; that were already really serious martial artists and that Wang Shenzhai then just kind of gave them something extra. And this is usually intersected, I think, with this, this, um, this issue of, you know, out, outside of China, you, you've not seen anyone really sparring with each one. Um, because, and, you know, one of the reasons for that is these people who've kind of gone to China, they're not really that interested in the fight side of things, is, is, is the reality. I mean, it's the empirical reality, you know, it was more to do with this, journey this this quest of exoticism and orientalism and um, they've, they've not gone to china because they wanted to learn how to fight you know so they've come back and they've come back and they're not really those the kind of people who are really interested in um practical martial arts that's for the most part for the most part i'm not saying everyone by any means but the vast majority obviously because there's just no evidence that any of them can do anything um other than a few exceptional honorable cases um, for the most part there's no evidence um, those people were not in that category forgive me i don't know everyone um, but i know some people so forgive me and be aware that i'm not talking about you um, i'm sure you probably feel the same way about these other people um, so it's kind of tied into that like 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 excuses why why can't they do that and then we start getting gaslighted around well you know it's it's phd level stuff and you know various different excuses like being above fighting and so you'll see these these you'll see these so-called each one people talking about you know the brutes who do who do ufc and all that and each one's not ugly nonsense like that and then i just i think like well, these are the kind of people who read Wang Shenzhai and then just revise it and like anything they don't like, it's like, oh no, the communists made him say that. But Wang Shenzhai says like, he addresses this question specifically and says like, what what looks ugly to people who don't know what they're talking about looks beautiful to people who do. And that's very much UFC, isn't it? Like if, if, you're, if you're an MMA fan like I am, 
um, it, like like you take time to actually it's incredibly skilled you know like serious level MMA is incredibly skilled and you see the beauty of the of what people are doing and you know Wang Shen Jai talks about that idea anyway that, it's a bit of a deviation maybe talk about that another time but some somehow interlinked like like it's like everything with these people it's everything exists in words like there's nothing in reality so it, it kind of damages our understanding of the importance of theory because they're only theory but it's pseudo theory and everything's in words and they try and trans because they can't do anything in reality they try and transform everything into a, a world of words and within that world of words they can give themselves titles they can put other people down they can insult people and they never have to prove anything at all so it all takes place in a world of, of language so they start talking about this idea of phd level um, and using this idea of wang shang jai students being being really high level and he, he teaches them and one of the things they're doing there is, is like creating like another accolade for themselves both in terms of describing themselves as being like PhD level or what they think PhD level means and also comparing themselves to Wang Shenzhai students which is quite interesting like saying we're like that um, and creating this kind of diversionary thing where you, they're not going to go and look carefully and see what they actually can do like you might, they might have a video of them waving their arms about or talking about theory but that, that will be it you know so let's unpack a couple of things there. Like, like, like first of all, I think there's a misunderstanding about what, what PhD means. Like a PhD is like a pimple on the, the body of knowledge. Like PhD is like a, a very specialist, tiny little thing. Like someone like Richard Dawkins, you know, like um, I think he's an emeritus professor now of, of understanding science. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of Richard Dawkins, but like, like his PhD is in something like, I think it's in uh, hierarchies in chickens. In chicken societies, something like you know, super niche, like it's a super niche thing. That's what a PhD is. It's a super niche contribution to knowledge. It's not like some kind of um, think. What 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 they're thinking is like it's like professor in some way. Like you, like you have this broad broad knowledge, whereas you know actual professors have like no matter broad knowledge, but they specialise in something. So, so someone I'd say was like genuinely PhD level. Um, I'd say someone like um, Nascau Tenshin, if you don't know, you know like he's got a Kyokushin karate background. And if you don't know him, look him up, he's a really exciting, great fighter. We well, must not forget the famous fight with Mayweather. Um, really great, exciting fighter who's specialised in, actually, he's not too bad at MMA, but mostly kickboxing. You know, it's like a specialised area where he is like top level. In, um, it's not this kind of, they, they, I think they think they're thinking of it like, I don't know, some kind of general, generalist level that they've, where they're great at everything or something like that. So a PhD isn't really like that at all, so it doesn't really work as a, as a metaphor. Secondly, let's get real here, right? So I've got a PhD, as I've mentioned before, um, but that makes me in the 1% most highly educated people in the UK. Um, that's a statistical fact. So if these people, these, you know, in the fantasy each one league, if they are PhD level, right, in martial arts, what, what that's, and we're not just talking about martial arts, are we? We're talking about practical fight-based martial arts. That's what they're saying. They are PhD level in practical fight-based martial arts, which is what each one is supposed to be. They are saying that they are in the top 1% highest level practical fight-based martial artists like let, let's say in Europe or North America now you just think about what that means right like I mean even within the like just the general community of MMA and um, Muay Thai and Sambo um, full contact karate judo boxing right just the general you know all the amateurs and people training and all that and then out of that community, there's the one percent who are the the top level competitors and fighters. <laughs> That's who they're comparing themselves to when they say that. That's what they mean by that. That they are that, which is just unbelievable. Like, um, 
and, and and it, it like I mean it's not just it's not just bizarre is it in terms of like you've got these people who like there's literally no evidence whatsoever that they even can use anything that we might call each one in any kind of practical where there's no evidence whatsoever it's all in a world of words is it's all about threatening people and trying to silence anyone who criticism criticizes them and uh, <laughs> If you weren't on the other side of the world, I'd come over and kick your ass for criticising me. It's like, oh, okay, right. Um, you weren't so, you weren't so shy about going over to the other side of the world to get you to pay for your certificate, were you? But, um, I'm not, I'm not glamorising illegal fights. I'll talk about that separately. Um, it's not just ridiculous. It's not just absolutely ridiculous in that level, is it? It's, it's, it's actually negative in terms of our understanding of what it means to be professional level in, in the modern age. I know, I, like I was looking at um, a great fighter in Liverpool, Paddy Pimble, the people's champion MMA fighter in UFC. And, you know, he's talking about, you know, he's a good, he's a good amateur MMA fighter. And then he's talking about the difference in terms of going professional so that you've not you've not got to work you've not got money worries in the same way um you can train all day you've got access to the top level coaches and equipment and everything like just radically transforms his level um so things like that just get obscured with this this idea that you know they'll actually say like you know i i stood for two hours a day <laughs> some are like i did five hours standing a day and all that and just um For what? For what though? You know, like uh, mis misunderstands the uh, what standing is for. But that's another that's another subject. So, so to compare themselves with this, that they are this, that they are this top level, that they are this one percent equivalent to, not just equivalent to. I mean, they think they're better than this. You know, uh, who? Who believes that? And the answer is the only people who believe that are other people who feel some kind of, it's everyone, it's everyone feels some kind of alienation, personality, something that you're perceiving as a lack in yourself, inferiority. You'd rather knock yourself out than genuinely face that in most cases. So we build these elaborate structures and we, we look for these elaborate structures that we can buy into. Um, that we can buy into where we can be part of something where we feel like we're special and it's not a coincidence is it that martial arts is the thing like for people who feel powerless for people who feel like you know there's nothing you can do about an alienating grinding system that makes you feel like you've got no status you've got no power you're just powerless and things are being done to you and so what do you become attracted to these structures that these structures that make you special you know and i'm not even saying that's a bad thing that's what gets people on that first level in many cases um, then it's largely down to your personality and the way you're going to progress and think about those things but what these people do is they they then create like new structures where they can capture that they can get money off you for them joining in that structure. They can convince you that they can parasitize that. They can exploit it by drawing you into that structure and, and you'll pay for it. You'll pay to get on your knees and grovel to one of these jokers. I mean, you couldn't make it up, could you? So finally this week, I just don't, don't want to give these people too much exposure, you know, like uh, I want to expose them, but not give them exposure. Um, Something else I saw as part of that conversation, I think it's just this kind of hilarious degeneration that, that you see when, like, it's okay to be that on your own. <laughs> like this ego monster who's, you know, like in your mind you've created this thing where your apex level fight god, who's never had a fight, um, where you're this Taoist, each one, you know, the fantasy each one league is all other martial arts, you know. It, it's okay to be that on your own, but what happens when two meet? 
<laughs> what happened? And the internet is wonderful for this because it allows this to happen for these two like behemoths of ego. Like I think of it like when you see two bull walruses like slamming together in the you know like competing over the the mate. So the only difference being like the bull walruses actually do it you know they actually they actually have a bit of a, a ding dong and they better get a bit physical and you know um and 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 those bull walrus has come out with zero bullshit zero bullshit comes out of their entusked mouths whatsoever zero theory they just like boom you know um uh, but I can't even imagine it, their egos smashing together like that so you've got these two these two absolute just coming out of nonsense like and um like, like a certain psychosociological thing happens where they can't like the, the the world isn't big enough for both of these to be the apex level Taoist master and the slightest deviation from um the slightest deviation from the way they see things must be wrong like there's no room for oh that's an interesting idea i haven't thought about that you know like, there's no room for that it's like no no i, I am the apex Taoist level master because because it's not just it's not just the cynical exploitation of people in most cases i mean you can think of one or two people who are just cynical exploiters but you know it's genuinely it's, this this structure that they built this structure of ego that they inhabit as part of it it's it's it, in and of itself by definition it's a recruitment strategy it's designed because they feel so inferior it's designed to bring people in underneath them literally probably in some cases of sexual assault and abuse um, there's plenty of cases of that that we see in martial arts um it's designed it's designed to capture and bring people in so it's not actually designed to disseminate useful information in any way or or do anything positive like that it's actually designed not, not even just to be this person existing on their own in their fantasy world <laughs> like why is they just go and train on their own won't they like and just get on with it no it's it, it, the, the personality structure itself is designed to capture other people in its orbit to be subordinates what those people want most of all is to have other people on their knees groveling to them in ceremonies and calling them master <laughs> just think about this right if like be, like 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 if the master called the students slaves, like you call the student, you call the master master and the master calls you slave, then you'd think about it very differently, wouldn't you? It's not one change I thought about it. You know, that's, that's how he criticised it, you know. Um, that's what they want. So when the two of these people meet, like they can't, they're both, both of their ego structures are trying to subordinate the other one. Um, and the pomposity will soon degenerate into, like, it's a bit like um, Crosby, Stills and Nash, you know, the great hippie band. <laughs> Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young at one time. Great band, all about peace and love. They all hate each other. <laughs> they couldn't hate each other anymore, you know, like, for all that peace and, for all that peace and love. So you, you will find the more someone poses themselves as a Taoist, enlightened being um the sooner the sooner they will degenerate into being the most horrible arrogant insulting just vile person imaginable to other human beings it's just you can bet money on it you can bet your mortgage on it usually it'll happen on the internet you can just watch it happen as a kind of digital sociology or digital psychology you can just guarantee within three or four posts these walruses of ego will be will be yeah taking chunks out of each other what what we'd like to see really is we'll get them in a room and we'll get them to put the gloves on then you will see some, some of these people i've seen um actually try and spar which is just hilarious like just um but then but, but most of them of course like like you young answers like there's this secret shame behind it that they just can't ever ever let anyone see anything like that that's why they do all this stuff like you know i'll just you know you do this on a student and the student goes back and all this like really trivial that's why they do stuff like that and that's why they just you know talk about theory like if like zhao daozin says if you saw the truth you'd just be like <laughs> um 
anyways, a kind of interlinked part of this, and it, it comes through quite a lot, and you see quite a lot of these, all these people I'm talking about kind of use this idea, and it's used in this discussion um, that, I was, that I was looking at, that, that Wang Shenzhai has something that you can't reverse engineer, that you can't, you know, you can't possibly, you know, it's something so beyond our understanding that you can't possibly get to it. And that then links into all this stuff as well. So another one of these fantasy Ichiban masters, you know, I mentioned before, has got this post up where he's talking about, you know, even though Wang Shenzhai says there are no secrets, he, he starts saying, well, you know, Wang Shenzhai didn't really mean that. And there's all these secrets and only, only initiated masters can tell you what these secrets are. And, um, so that, that's a very interesting idea that there are no secrets like um, that, that Wang Shenzhai talks about. And like everything with Wang Shenzhai, and it does relate to this that I'm talking about. Um, like everything with Wang Shenzhai, it's like there's levels and levels and, and, and it's almost like gamified. Like the, 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 more you, the more you genuinely practice, you know, honestly in terms of fight training and combining the elements of each one towards a, a fight training outcome. The more you see the like different levels in Wang Shenzhai's thinking, so the the idea of there being no secrets isn't just about um, it isn't just about teachers being open. You know, it's a more profound idea than that. You talk about Taoism and stuff like that. It's a much more profound idea. It, it it's about the idea that you already know everything really that you need to know in terms of movement you know for most people for most people i suppose if you've been if you've been paralyzed all your life and unable to move then you might not know that but experiential knowledge for people who've moved who, who move then you do know there's so all these it speaks to this idea that you can't actually learn each one at all you just unfold it and this is obviously obviously kryptonite to these ego walruses <laughs> because their entire ego structure is designed to draw you in and you know it's usually about money it doesn't have to be about money exploitation doesn't have to be about money and, and Yu Yong Yan particularly is is specific on this and he says like it doesn't have to be about money and it doesn't even have to be dishonest like like you can genuinely believe and most of them do genuinely believe that they are the real deal for some unknown reason like um in the back of their minds, they must they must think at some point like, well, well, they must when anyone mentions sparring or anything like that, they must absolutely crap themselves. They must think, you know, like God, I've got to avoid that at all costs. You know, maintain the fantasy. Uh, but Yu Yong Yan says it's still exploitation, even if they just exploit your time, um, and even if they think they're being honest about it, it's still it's still criminal. He calls it criminal. Um, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. There's people who claim to be descended from Zhao Dao's in. Who were absolutely appalling and spout the most nonsense and people who descended so called from Yu Yong Yan who were just absolutely appalling. There's, there's, there's no way of, there's no way of, uh, well there's a way of being really with it but I'll talk about that another time. Uh, so that the whole ego structure and the whole business structure is structured around this idea that that each one comes from them and they transmit it like, like this kind of apostolic church where Jesus put his hand on Saint Peter and then Saint Peter put his hand on the head of the next, you know, patriarch. And so when it goes on like this, and you know, and all the apostles and bishops are all in this apostolic succession, somehow the grace of God is passed down through this feudal cascade. Um, so this there's a particular person um, who's a famous European Ichiban instructor who wrote this post on Facebook where he's talking, he's actually saying this like he is like the guardian of the so he's a really famous, you know, orthodox. Each one instructs. He's the guardian of these secrets, and this is what this is what yeah this is what Wang Shengjai really meant. Apparently, that he didn't mean that there are no secrets. He meant that there really are secrets, and you've got to pay this individual to find them. And also, also explicitly saying in this article, you know, you've got to get on your knees and grovel in the Baixi and be a be a, a slave to the master. And the master disciple relationship is so important in this. Um, well, they would say that, wouldn't they? Because they want your money and your time and your worship. They would say that. Um, whereas what Wang Shengzhi is saying is, no, really, there are no secrets. Like, step by step through intuitive progression and training properly and um, 
I'll, I'll talk about what I mean by training properly, but even that, you intuitive, it's not a secret, you know. You, you, you combine intuitive development of um, whole body connectivity and quintessence principles of Chinese Wushu, and you combine them with the latest ideas in fight training. It's, you know, and the best, the latest and the best available ideas in fight training it's as simple as that you follow that you follow that path honestly and everything unfolds and all those secrets are revealed in time